Well, thanks everybody. That was a nice intro on the planned and unplanned. Um, uh, Brian was a roommate of mine. Uh, we lived in Zom. You've probably seen pictures of us in his... Yeah. Anyway, uh, glad to be here. Um, today, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. When I graduated from Notre Dame, uh, I was an arts and letters engineer. I don't know if they still have those, oh, two degrees. Uh, I went to work for GE Aircraft Engines in Cincinnati, Ohio. I uh, did some pretty neat stuff there, worked on some military programs, worked on some commercial engine programs. Uh, picked up a couple of patents while I was there on uh, an engine that never made it to production, but interesting, uh, interesting nonetheless. Uh, in 1990, I went to work for a company called ABB Power Generation. They're a Swiss, German, Swedish uh, conglomerate who was uh, uh, looking at uh, power generation in the United States. We moved from Cincinnati to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, spent 15 years in uh, Richmond with ABB Power Generation. Uh, over the years there, I, I, I went from being a senior engineer to uh, vice president. Uh, designed, built, and serviced power plants, mainly gas turbine combined cycle, and then the large coal-fired or nuclear-fired uh, steam turbines, generators, that kind of thing. Last thing I did for them was I, I built a business for them that uh, took it from scratch to about 50 million in less than three years without acquisitions. Uh, where we serviced uh, competitors' power generation equipment. So uh, pick a GE, a uh, big turbine or generator, or a Westinghouse or Siemens uh, turbine or generator, and we serviced uh, them in competition with GE and, and Siemens. And if you want to get good at what you're doing, compete with the likes of somebody like GE or with the likes of somebody like Siemens, because they're pretty darn good. Uh, in uh, 2005, uh, we moved to Houston, Virginia. I was recruited to go to uh, work for an oil and gas company. Uh, and uh, we went through a merger in that time period with our number one competitor. Uh, I ran their manufacturing operations. We had four large facilities across North America, about half a billion in revenue, and about a thousand associates uh, in those four facilities. And then in 2008, I uh, was recruited to a renewable energy company, and we moved to Denver. And now Denver, actually Golden, Colorado, is our home. So we can see the brewery from just down the street. Uh, luckily, the wind blows the other way most of the time. Uh, we're nestled right up there against the foothills, so really, really love Denver. Um, so today, uh, let, me, let me tell you a little bit more about composite tech structures and One World Energy. One World Energy is uh, comprised of, of really three divisions. Uh, we develop solar parks, uh, a lot of rooftop type things. Uh, we also develop wind farms, so uh, we've got people out talking to farmers. Uh, looking at the wind regime, putting up MET towers, uh, getting them to lease their land to us for eventual development of wind farms. And then I'm responsible for our services division, uh, which means uh, we go out and when wind turbines break, uh, typically there are two things that will break on a wind turbine. It's the blades, because uh, they're out in the atmosphere, they're getting struck by lightning, uh, they could be cracks or other things like that for manufacturing. Uh, we go out and take care of those. And also on the solar side, mainly on uh, photovoltaics, they require a little bit of maintenance, not too much, so my, my group takes care of that. Uh, some of the other things we do at uh, Composite Tech, um, you see some large shapes here. Uh, we do uh, uh, simulator housings for flight simulators. Uh, that requires a high precision. Uh, typically, they're fiberglass. They need to be light because they're up on these motion platforms. I don't know how many of you have seen that Lexus commercial where they've got this motion platform going around, and they slide, they tilt, they angle. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a car that we created for the University of Leeds. There's a dome that goes around it. It needs to be high precision, high accuracy, because they project the images on the inside of the surface. Uh, we do a lot of that for flight simulators, uh, for Airbus, or for military applications. And uh, we're just now getting into helicopter simulators. So that's about 20% of what we do at Composite Tech Structures. You can see they're fairly big elements. Uh, they need to be close tolerance, uh, high precision. Uh, and so we do, uh, do that for about 20% of our, our overall revenue. Uh, the bulk of what we do uh, in the service division right now is uh, work on wind turbine blades. We'll manufacture blades. Most blades these days, um, early days they were made out of wood when they were really small and had some composites or fiberglass resins, that kind of thing that, that held the wood together. Nowadays they're almost all composites, fiberglass. There are some that have uh, what's called carbon-carbon. Uh, that's a composite material that you'll see on a lot of later age military aircraft because it's very strong, um, very light. Uh, 
uh, but it's also pretty expensive. So in wind turbine blades, uh, they are used for a couple of structural elements, but most of the other stuff uh, that's used for a wind turbine blade is fiberglass. As I said earlier, um, they are subject to erosion because they're out in the wind, sand flowing over them, uh, everything like that. And over time, they'll be subject to uh, lightning strikes every now and then, which will form uh, cracks or things like that that you need to repair so that water and other things like that don't get in the blade. And then you start shaking the wind turbine, and, and it's not good. Uh, if you want to work in the wind business, uh, can't be afraid of heights. Uh, you see this guy out here, he's actually balancing a rotor. Uh, he's probably about 120 feet up in the air. Now he's, uh, he's, he's um, you know, got safety harness and, and, he's, and he's anchored off, but still if uh, you're afraid of heights or if you're claustrophobic um, because when you get inside the nacelle, that's the, uh, the casing that sits atop, it's a pretty tight space up there. So you know, we, we will put people through uh, the rigors of climbing. Uh, there's actually uh, businesses out there that will go up to the uh, nacelle uh, they'll climb out of the nacelle and then they'll rappel on ropes down the blades. Um, and so if you're a rock climber, uh, you don't mind that kind of thing, there's work for you in the wind business. I don't do that. Uh, what you see down here, another way to access the blades is on what we call work access platforms where uh, uh, there'll be a pulley system and platform, uh, two or three people can go up, a little bit more stable platform that you can work on a blade than uh, hanging by ropes. Um, and what you see down here, uh, this is a blade that we made uh, several years ago, and it has to go through some uh, dynamics, some load, some structural testing to make sure that you know, we said it would break at this weight or this load, and we have to actually verify that. That's part of the certification process. Um, so today what I want to cover, uh, I want to cover a little bit uh, overview of the energy market. It's going to be uh, uh, pretty quick, concentrate on electricity. I'll give you a week of physics in about 25 seconds. Uh, some characteristics of the U.S. market, uh, who, who some of the players are. Uh, we'll look at a couple of other countries and uh, what the issues that they have in those countries that may have maybe drive them, driving them towards how they're responding and how they've set up their electric generation and what kind of fuel sources they use. Uh, we'll talk about some of the terms uh, that are, are, are part of this debate in sustainability and renewable energy. Uh, what do some of them mean? Uh, if you haven't heard them, you probably will. Um, and I'll switch to uh, wind energy. Uh, we'll look at some of the main features of wind turbine, uh, some of the key considerations for the wind market, not only globally, but I'll concentrate more on the U.S. Uh, focus on some of the major wind companies, who they are, uh, what kinds of things they're doing. And then uh, spend a little bit of time talking about what are some different government policies, what are some of the impacts of those policies, and how do we see that in terms of where the money's flowing, what actions people are taking, that kind of thing. Then I want to walk you through uh, three examples uh, of uh, you know, the successes, some of the challenges, some of the issues that are facing different developments, different aspects of the wind market. We're going to look at Cape Wind, which is the first proposed U.S. offshore wind farm. Whether it's going to still be the first that gets built, we'll see. Uh, whether it ever gets built, we'll see. So we'll, we'll go through Cape Wind. Uh, then I want to move west, and we're going to look at the state of Wyoming. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the sage grouse, sage grouse, and we'll talk about the competing uh, uh, access to federal lands for wind versus oil and gas versus coal. And Wyoming is a good microcosm of some of the things that are facing uh, those different uh, aspects of trying to get the resources out of the state. And then the last one I want to walk through from a, uh, an example standpoint is looking at the province of Ontario in Canada. Uh, they've got a very proactive, very aggressive uh, green energy program that is going on in Ontario. I'll talk about how they got to there, uh, what the progress is, and what the prospects are for Ontario. I'll give you a couple of um, uh, opportunities for questions as we go through, but uh, when we get through the examples, uh, have some time for Q&A, uh, and then I want to wrap up uh, after that, okay? So here's your uh, uh, a week of physics in a very short period of time. You know, uh, how do you make electricity? Well, there are a couple of different ways, but primarily you, you spin a turbine that spins a generator that rotates a magnet inside of a coil of wire, okay? And that action electrifies the wire. There's your week of physics. <laughs> now, uh, to rotate the turbine, uh, typically steam 
or combustion gases in, in a gas turbine are used, uh, sometimes wind and sometimes water. When you see a dam, that water is spinning a turbine. Those things turn the turbine that is connected to the generator, that, that creates electri electricity. When steam is used, uh, typically fossil fuels are burned to uh, boil the water to create steam. So in steam turbines, you're either burning coal, you're burning natural gas, a little bit of oil, uh, depending on, on where you are, um, or it could be a nuclear reaction where you're using a nuclear reaction to heat the steam or heat the water into steam, and then that goes through a steam turbine. For uh, solar, uh, two really different ways on solar. You, you've got photovoltaics, which uh, translate or, or create electricity directly from sunlight. It's a DC uh, electricity that it creates. Or there are, if you see fields and fields of mirrors, uh, that'll be a concentrating solar. Uh, they are heating typically water, but it could be some oil or it could be some molten salt uh, that then goes into a steam turbine, spins to create le electricity. Okay? Now, uh, we'll look at the U.S. You know, the U.S. is, is really blessed uh, with an abundance of natural resources. Uh, if you look at, for the U.S., what our different fuel sources are, you know, coal is the predominant uh, fuel source used for the generation of electricity in the United States. It is our most abundant uh, fossil fuel resource. You know, I think we've got three, four hundred years worth of coal in the U.S. that could be used to generate electricity. Uh, what you see is that earlier uh, a lot of brown coals, a lot of high sulfur coals were used, you know, from the West Virginia, Pennsylvania areas uh, with the uh, restrictions and, and the concentration on environmental issues. Uh, a lot of utilities are switching to uh, uh, lower sulfur content coals. You'll hear a lot about the uh, Powder River Basin. So a lot of uh, uh, utilities these, these days have converted over and are using a cleaner coal, a, a, a lower sulfur coal that comes out of the Powder River Basin area of Wyoming and Montana. Uh, natural gas uh, represents about a quarter of the generation that we have in the United States. Now, natural gas, um, you know, I did a study about three years ago where we looked at the amount of natural gas that we have in the United States, and we had about 15 years at that point, three years ago, uh, 15 years worth of natural gas in terms of proved reserves. Well, in the last year or two, they've really uh, developed um, some, some great technology to be able to drill and, and uh, get into to aspects and, and seams. Uh, there's a thing called hydraulic fracturing, uh, which has been used in the... Dallas-Fort Worth, it's called the Barnett Shale for many years. That's now being employed up in the West Virginia, Pennsylvania area. And what it, what it comes down to is that uh, they've been able to extract a lot more gas out of um, plays that were going to be uneconomical or they didn't have the technology um, you know, several years ago. So with recent discoveries in the last couple of years, our proved reserves have gone from like 15 years, meaning how much gas we have, how quickly we're consuming it, divide that and that's the number of years you get. Now we've gone from 15 years up to 70, 80, uh, almost 90 years. 16% um, or so of the natural gas that we, we bring in uh, today are, is from Canada uh, and that's about how much we import. Uh, over the years uh, our projections are that uh, that percent of import is going to decrease because we found these new domestic plays. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you have seen this documentary. Uh, there was a documentary done by a guy uh, where he was visiting different farms up in uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania area, uh, where he was, you know, looking at the risks of this hydraulic fracturing, what it's doing to the groundwater, other things like that. I don't know. Did anybody of you see that, uh, that documentary? You know, people would turn on their kitchen faucet, he'd bring a lighter over, and, and the water would catch on fire. So, and I think, uh, was it T. Boone Pickens was on John Stewart the other night, and uh, John um, threw him a zinger and said, well, what about this uh, fracking it's called? Is it dangerous for the water table? And T. Boone said, well, I've done 3,000 wells and we've never had an issue. And, and he said, well, have you seen the documentary about, you know, you can light your kitchen faucet on fire? So, uh, and, you know, it was, it was uh, there are parts of the world where that may be an issue. Uh, it hasn't seemed to be an issue in Texas. Um, this uh, documentary uh, filmmaker found some, some issues uh, with what's going on in, in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. So, you know, the issues with what uh, fuel sources we use, uh, nothing's easy. There's always a trade-off. Um, when you look at nuclear, 
Uh, about 20% of our, our generations from nuclear. Um, the last nuclear plant that we put in the U.S. was built in 1990, or commissioned in 1996. If all of you remember, in 79, we had an accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, a lot of nuclear power generation at that time was canceled, postponed. Nuclear, planned nuclear plants were converted to, to coal. Um, last one being built in, commissioned in 1996. Uh, that's, what, 15 years? A lot of nuclear plants that were originally designed for a 30-year life cycle have been relicensed. So now that they'll, they'll be operating for 60 years. A little bit uh, interesting there uh, with regard to the technology and taking something that was intended for 30 years and now saying it's going to be good for double that time. But still, you know, we have uh, about 20% of our electricity generation is from nuclear. Okay? Uh, and then we get into conventional hydroelectric, uh, other renewable. Uh, this is uh, EIA, the um, Energy Information Agency, I think it stands for. You know, they consider a hydroelectric to be a renewable energy. You know, you can debate that. But, you know, 7% of what we, we get is from dams and, and other things like that, run of river uh, or things like the Hoover Dam. Uh, other renewable, you look at this, uh, it's a very small percentage, less than 5% of our current mix. Wind's about 2%. Uh, solar, uh, you know, even less. Wood and wood-derived um, stuff, wood chips, things like that. I don't know if I would call that a renewable. I guess trees do grow, but you know, regrow, but uh, whether that you would consider that a renewable energy or not, I don't know. Um, let's see. Da -da -da. Operate, okay. Uh, one of the interesting things about nuclear is that they're out there aggressively marketing themselves as carbon-free. So, uh, and th there is a, a lot of serious study. Uh, some utilities, I know, say Virginia Power, sorry, Dominion Energy, uh, they are working on getting a third reactors at some of these sites um, are ready for licensing. There are probably a dozen or so uh, nuclear sites, that's not good, uh, that are in, in the early stages of uh, uh, you know, licensing. Uh, but if you want to talk about how long that'll take to build a nuclear plant these days, it might take you 15 years uh, to get one built just because of cost overruns, construction costs, and, and opponents. Um, okay. Some of the players that you see uh, in this space, uh, public utilities like American Electric Power, uh, XL Energy, which is in Minnesota and Colorado, Duke, Exelon, uh, Southern Cal Edison, you've heard of some of these. Uh, Fifteen or so years ago, they introduced uh, competition into this space. They were always regulated by public utility commissions. They owned the wires and the generating assets, and, and now with the introduction of some competition, there are other generating assets uh, assets that can sell power into the wires that these utilities own. Uh, in the U.S., there are three grids that you sell the power into. There are independent system operators. There's a grid ma mainly on the East Coast that's AC. There's a grid on the West Coast that's uh, also AC. And then Texas, for some reason, has their own grid, and it's a DC. That's a direct current grid. So uh, you see a lot of power plants that are put in, uh, you know, along the Texas border so that they can feed either into the Texas grid or into the east or western grid, okay? Uh, some other things, you know, electricity really can't be stored easily. Uh, it just can't. Uh, you can talk about batteries, but in terms of the battery capacity, they are inadequate, uh, at least at this day and age, to be able to really uh, serve as any kind of backup for the electricity demand. So uh, every day, uh, the uh, independent system operators, utility executives have to worry about demand. What's tomorrow going to be like? Is it going to be the same as yesterday? Uh, I've got a base load where you know, that's the power that everybody's going to need. Nuclear power and, uh, and coal are very good for just base load. You turn the switch on, it stays on for the next six months or a year. Then the other thing you've got is what's called an intermediate load that might change uh, every other week or so, a little bit of fluctuation. And then uh, uh, you've got this thing called peak demand. And utility executives, in a private moment, will call those the golden hours when uh, you get into peak pricing. Uh, hopefully, um, you don't run into that and you get an electricity bill that uh, you're, you're paying peak demand. But those are typically, uh, you know, during the day when people wake up, turn on their coffee machine, you, you'll see a, a spike in power, uh, power demand. And so utilities have to be ready for that. So they've got assets that are ready, spinning reserve to, to meet that power and they've got to be fairly quick in responding to that. And then it kind of dies out during the day, and then when everybody gets home, turns on the air conditioner, 
four, five, six o'clock, you'll see another daily peak. And that's generally what happens. A little bit of a peak in the morning, and then a little bit bigger peak in the evening when people come home and flip on the air conditioner. Okay? Um, you know, the uh, recent Texas brownouts, uh, some of you in the Dallas, Austin area, they had some rolling brownouts, and that was primarily uh, more caused by uh, competition for a fuel source. A lot of people using natural gas to heat their homes. It was so cold down there that the uh, demand for natural gas for home heating uh, exceeded the uh, available supply between home heating and, and power generation for, you, for uh, the power plants. And so there were parts of Dallas, uh, my, my sales guy lives in Dallas, um, and uh, they cut his power off and he had to go uh, to another part of the city. Austin, they were doing uh, rolling brownouts because they lost uh, the power to fuel the, the uh, power plants because of the uh, demand between home heating and power generation. Okay. Uh, talk about peak uh, demand, I was at a, a little seminar a couple of months ago and a guy from Fort Collins, he's a facility manager for uh, Woodward Governor, he was telling us that over the last, uh, I think 2008, he paid about a million and a half in electricity for these two large manufacturing facilities. Uh, he was telling us about his load demand work that he was doing and he was trying to use smart meters and really trying to, to, to manage how much electricity they were using because he told us of that one and a half million, he spent $600,000 of that one and a half million for 20 hours of electricity. So you look at, well, the return on, if I can manage the load, if I can save $600,000 of peak demand, because the price goes up, you can imagine, when it's peak hours by four to five times. But over the course of two years, 20 hours of operation costing you $600,000? Yeah, I'd, I'd go try to get some of that money back, and, and they're, so they're going through a load management program. Just talk about the importance of staying out of peak and managing load shedding, uh, managing your demand so that you don't run into those peak hours. Looking at this, you know, without any drastic changes, uh, this is what the EIA says we're going to look like in 2035. Now, a lot of activity, a lot of discussion around we want to be 20% renewable by 2020 or 30% by 2020 or 30% by 2030. Uh, EIA is looking at this and saying, eh, it's going to be hard to get there or along current trends, it's going to be hard to get there. Nuclear is still going to be a huge part. Renewables are going to increase, but uh, not to get up to the 20% level. Natural gas stay about the same. Uh, coal usage uh, will come down a, a tidbit, but uh, they're not projecting a big change in our energy mix, okay, unless we do something about it. Looking at uh, energy, uh, it's really global uh, from the standpoint of uh, what are the demands, uh, who's getting the, the fuel sources. It drives the, the dynamics, the politics of a lot of countries because they may or may not have the ability to generate and fuel their economies with uh, fuel sources that they control. So I want to walk you through a couple of different countries. Uh, Spain, uh, about a tenth of the energy usage that we have in the US. Uh, you see their mix here. Natural gas makes up primarily what, uh, most of what they do. They've got some nuclear reactors. Coal is a very small percentage of what they do. Uh, they are number two in the world in terms of how much of their energy mix comes from wind. They were aggressive in uh, feed-in tariffs, introducing uh, and, and attracting not only solar but wind energy to the country. Uh, the problem that uh, Spain has as they look forward here is that most of the natural gas, all of the natural gas they get is imported. So they're getting it from countries like uh, Algeria, Qatar, um, and Nigeria. Uh, most of it, about two-thirds of that is LNG, which is liquefied natural gas. But you talk about fueling your economy, uh, they don't own the resource that uh, provides the electricity for their country, which will drive some dynamics in, in geopolitics about who they align with and uh, who they need to be friendly to, uh, those kinds of things, because their economy is being fueled by a natural resource from another country. Um, you look at it, uh, just as an aside, there are uh, three countries in the world uh, that have over half of the natural gas reserves, uh, Qatar, Russia, and Iran. So Qatar, very active in the LNG. Uh, Russia is basically fueling the natural gas needs of, of uh, Western Europe. Uh, you remember a couple of years ago, uh, Russia turned off the gas because Ukraine hadn't been paying the bills. Uh, they also turned off the gas to Western Europe. 
and uh, got a lot of attention very quickly uh, because if you can't heat your house, if you can't uh, generate electricity, you're going to react. If you look at Germany, uh, Germany about 20% of the uh, electricity generation that we have in the United States. Um, coal uh, being predominant uh, amount for Germany. Uh, nuclear uh, being about a quarter uh, natural gas. Um, wind for Germany is about, uh, they're number five in the world in terms of uh, wind capacity. And what's interesting here is that you know, Chernobyl in 1986 just scared the heck out of a, a lot of Western Europe uh, about the, the risks of nuclear power. There was a coalition government that was uh, uh, elected in 1998, I believe it was, and they had on their platform that they were going to be getting rid of nuclear power in Germany. And so for about 10 years, they were marching along in that movement to get rid of nuclear power. Uh, when they looked at the mix and said, well, if we get rid of this, what do we replace it with? They didn't really have an answer. So in 2009, they reversed that and said, no, you know, we're going to hang on to nuclear power for a while. One of the other things that they're doing uh, in, in this natural gas that you see here, all of that's coming from Russia. So it's a cleaner burning uh, fossil fuel. Uh, it'd be a good replacement for coal, but it's coming from somebody else. So that's a risk to them. Um, if you look at uh, uh, one of the things they have relative to coal, uh, Germany said that they want to get rid of their hard coal mines by, what is it, 2018? Uh, whether they're actually going to be able to do that or not, they're starting to import coal from South America, Australia. Uh, but if you can imagine importing half of the fuel source uh, that's going to fuel your economy from different parts of the world, it's a geopolitical risk for Germany. And it, t it will temper and, and uh, modify uh, how they move forward. The other thing, uh, any, any of you been to Germany? Um, yeah, so if you drive around, you'll see uh, little cities and you'll see three or four wind turbines uh, by these little villages. A little different in Germany than it is in the States. Uh, in the States, you'll have big wind farms that are off. You can see them from the road, but they're out in the middle of nowhere. Whereas in Germany, they're clustered around villages and they supply, uh, for the most part, they, they're supplying the electricity needs of that local village or local city. 6% uh, of their electricity comes from wind in Germany. Real, brief, real briefly on, on France, France is kind of unique. Uh, they get three quarters of their electricity from nuclear. And now remember, nuclear uh, likes to, you, you turn it on, you let it run. And it doesn't like to be cycled up and down. That's not good for nuclear generation. But they get three quarters of their generation from electricity. So probably why Paris is the city of lights, because they want to keep the lights on all the time, because they don't like to cycle them up and down. That makes them independent. But it also has some implications from the standpoint of uh, they like a base load. Um, they probably would, will want to export some of that to other countries because they got a lot of stuff that just runs full bore all the time. They're starting to look at wind. They're starting to look at other things. But it's primarily uh, a nuclear-powered country. Obviously, they need to be comfortable with what they're doing with their nuclear waste, right? China. Um, China passed the U.S. last year in terms of the largest consumer of electricity. Passed us right by. 80% of what they produce is from coal. And unfortunately, it's high sulfur coal. Um, which means, well, let me read some statistics. Um, China is now the world's largest source of sulfur dioxide, which leads to acid rain. They are the largest source. Projections at current trends, uh, if this continues, China will emit as much CO2 themselves as the whole world did today. Um, they've done some studies in the LA and, and uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, a third of the airborne or, 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 or particulate um, air pollution uh, in the LA and San Francisco area is attributed to coal plants in China. Okay. So it's not just the cars. Uh, and you talk about a global issue, uh, the smog in LA and, and, and the Bay Area, uh, some of that's coming from coal plants in China. Um, world Bank has said that 16 of the, world's, uh, of the world's 20 worst cities in terms of uh, quality of air are in China. Uh, the Beijing air quality is uh, 16 times worse than New York City. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, they, they've kind of been killing their country to 
progress their economy. Now they're starting to do some things with regard to scrubbers and cleaning up the coal technology, but they've got a basis where it's high sulfur, and so that's going to be just nasty stuff to clean up. But that's what they've got, and that's what they're doing to, to fuel their economy. They've uh, uh, started an aggressive program to increase their nuclear. Uh, they, they are uh, aggressively pursuing wind, but with the amount of electricity generation or electricity they consume, it's still only 1% or 2%. Uh, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be high sulfur coal from China. And that's going to impact us. It's going to impact the world. All right, some things you're going to hear about from a terminology standpoint. Uh, all of you have probably heard about greenhouse gases. That's carbon dioxide, right? Global warming. So the question is, you know, is, there, uh, is the climate changing due to man's activity? Uh, is there something we can or should do about it? You know, unfortunately, it's become a politicized topic, and about half of the country thinks that global warming is not real, that it's just natural um, earth cycles that uh, it will go through, and, and we re really don't need to do anything about it. That's about what I'd say about half the country feels. Okay? Uh, some other things you'll hear, energy independence, energy security. Well, what does that mean? You know, and and what, what should we be willing to pay for energy independence or energy security? Uh, national energy policy, which we do not have, uh, well, what should, that, uh, what should that contain? What should, that, what should be in there? And really, uh, do we think a national energy policy is going to be achievable? We talk about the grid. And probably one of the uh, you know, greatest engineering marvels is that we've been able to electrify the U.S. and you know, some trailer home on the mesas of Arizona can flick a light switch and they, they get electricity uh, from a power plant that's on a river in Tennessee. Uh, I mean, the grid is really um, uh, something that uh, is, is very advantageous for the U.S. The issue we've got now is that the existing grid we have doesn't necessarily suit wind energy very well. And we'll go through that in, the, in, in a little bit uh, more detail. Environmental stewardship, clean coal, um, you know, electric vehicles. Uh, what are we going to do about the, the, uh, the future there? Carbon tax, carbon credits, cap and trade. Really, the attempt there is that we try and develop some vehicle where we can pay the true cost of what it is that we're generating from a carbon standpoint. Hasn't worked too well. They've tried it in Europe. Didn't work too well there. And probably my uh, favorite uh, term, NIMBY. Uh, anybody know what NIMBY stands for? Not in my backyard. And uh, Cape Wind's a good example of that. We'll go through that. Um, and uh, California's been a good example of that. They love the power. They just don't want to have any ugly power plants in their state. And that led to some problems for them in 2001 that led to the bankruptcy of Southern Cal Edison, Pacific Gas and Electric. Enron had a little bit to do with that. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about NIMBYs in a little bit. All right, how does wind figure in? Anybody uh, uh, seen a wind turbine uh, up close? Okay, uh, we'll go through some of the features here. Um, the thing about a wind turbine is you're actually putting the power plant up 200, 250 feet in the air. So you've got uh, blades, and uh, all of the modern turbines are three-bladed turbines just because the Danes thought that was prettier than two blades. That's really the reason why. It's connected into a rotor. Uh, most of the uh, 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 turbines that are out there today are, have gears in them. So these turbines are spinning at 10 to 18 RPM. Uh, this gearbox that's in here converts that uh, slow, high torque to you know, 1,800 RPMs that runs then the generator. Okay? So you've got about uh, 100, maybe 200 tons of stuff on top of a tubular steel tower that's hollow inside that has ladders so that people who service this thing climb up and down ladders. Uh, and if you want to get tired, climb a ladder you know, two, three times a day going up 250 feet with uh, maybe 30, 40 pounds of equipment, tools, et cetera, strapped on your back. Some have service uh, lifts inside them. Uh, some of the modern ones do. Um, there's a uh, wind vane and an, and an anemometer on the back so you can s sense wind speed. Uh, these wind turbines will turn into the wind. So that's called yawing. So that uh, nacelle on top of the, uh, of the wind turbine will rotate around so that it's facing into the wind. The uh, blades also pitch, so they'll do this. Uh, it's like if you've ever been on a propeller aircraft, they pitch as well. And that just uh, improves the efficiency 
Uh, it also allows you to feather the blade so that they're out of the wind, so that when you don't want it turning, you don't get the wind to turn the turbine. Okay? Uh, and then the uh, you know, uh, generator, that's our, our 25 seconds of physics. That's where the electricity comes. Goes down inside the tower to a transformer, goes out the switch yard, and then goes to the grid. All right? Um, okay. Uh, some other things that are unique about this is that for a wind turbine, you bring the power plant to the fuel source. For all other kinds of electricity, you're bringing the fuel source to the power plant. So, you know, a lot of power plants are along rivers or lakes or even the ocean. And the reason they're on rivers or lakes or oceans is they use the, that water as cooling water to, to help condense the steam back to water to then get uh, heated again and go back through the cycle. Um, but there, you're bringing the fuel to the, to the power plant. Here, uh, you are bringing the uh, power plant to the fuel. Blades these days are about 45 meters long. One blade, 45 meters long, probably weigh 18,000 pounds each. So you got three of those on here. Um, the uh, modern turbines are standing 90 to 100 meters tall. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's better wind the higher up you go. But you got a trade off there. You got 200 some tons up there. Uh, think about building this thing. Uh, one of the uh, challenges of the wind business is that you've got to have large cranes to be able to pick these things to put them up that high. And then what do you do to service them? Uh, getting at these things when they're that high in the ground is not a very economical thing to do. And that drives some decisions on how you service them. Um, in general, oh, I wrote down here, you know, one megawatt uh, will light about maybe 300 some homes. Average size of new turbines going in these days is a little over two megawatts. So, you know, one, one wind turbine can power 500 to 800 homes, just as, a, as, a, as kind of a gauge there. Uh, let's see. I uh, heard an interesting uh, anecdote uh, from a guy a couple years in Houston. He said, uh, you know, if you're in the business of making money off of your land, like a farmer, you're going to like a wind turbine because you're making money off of your land. If you bought the land for the view, you're probably not going to like a, a wind turbine because it's going to obstruct your view. And he said, um, you know, the desirability of a wind turbine is inversely proportional to the number of Starbucks you have in the local community. Think about that for a minute. Uh, offshore turbines are going to be, you know, five megawatts plus and lots of artist uh, depictions of these things being big enough that you can land helicopters on them. I mean, they're going to be that big uh, as, as we move forward. Um, it'll take 500 wind turbines, 500, to replace one nuclear unit, okay? So you're talking about trade-offs here. One nuclear unit eh, maybe takes up uh, 30 acres, uh, 500 wind turbines takes up a lot more, okay? We look at uh, worldwide. Uh, the U.S. was uh, number one in terms of installed wind capacity up until 2010. Uh, 2010 was a bad year for wind energy, uh, relatively speaking, in terms of installations. We were about half or less than half of the rate of 2009. China was installing wind turbines at three times the rate of the U.S. Europe was installing wind turbines uh, last year at two times the rate of the U.S. They passed us by. They've got uh, 42 gigs of wind turbines in China now. And a gigawatt is uh, nine zeros behind it, OK? Um, US is number two at uh, 40. Uh, we represent 20% of the worldwide installed wind base. But if you remember, it only makes up about 2% of our installed base in the US. So we're big in the world, but in a very, uh, very big pond, I guess, because um, we're very small relative to the amount of energy we use in the U.S. Germany's number three. Spain's number four in terms of installed capacity. Uh, in terms of, uh, I think India's number five at about 11 gig, and then everybody else is kind of noise after that. Uh, Latin America, not much wind. Middle East, not much wind. Canada's got about four gigawatts, so about 10% of the U.S. Um, if you look at wind capacity per person, Denmark is tops. Uh, they get 20% uh, of their wind uh, their, their power from wind. Spain's number two. Um, U.S. is number eight in that category. This is a, uh, a chart of the wind power average annual. And uh, got to be careful here. It's average annual, okay? So that means on average uh, it's this. Well, next year it might be different. Last year it could have been different. Uh, let me walk through some of the things here uh, while you absorb this. 
you know, many states uh, have adopted renewable portfolio standards. They want 20% by 2020 or 30% by 2020, whatever. Um, Iowa and Minnesota right now have over 7% of their energy coming from renew renewables. Colorado is 6%. North Dakota is uh, 5%. I don't know, did they talk about, you know, what is Notre Dame? You know, you look at this a little uh, different colors here, uh, but, you know, relative to how good's the wind in this area, probably not very or good enough to have uh, some wind farms uh, around the area. And I don't think you get it passed if you put a wind turbine up that's going to block the view of the dome. You know, some of those issues. Um, we look at the uh, uh, United States here. The uh, uh, Indiana is also one of only 14 states that doesn't have a renewable portfolio standard. Um, I guess last year in some of the debates, there was uh, some strong interest in getting nuclear power entered in as a renewable energy. So uh, they are one of 14 states. Indiana is one of 14 states that doesn't have a, a standard. Uh, some of the standards are mandatory. Uh, some are voluntary. Um, Illinois, Minnesota, Oregon want 25% by the year 2025. California uh, and New York are the most aggressive states right now. California wants a third of their energy from renewable energy by um, 2020. And uh, New York wants 29% by 2015, uh, which will be, I think, uh, really hard for them to achieve. But that's the goal that they've set for themselves. In uh, 2004, Colorado uh, was the first state to pass by ballot initiative a renewable portfolio standard. They said, uh, we want 10% uh, by 2020. Uh, in uh, 2007, legislature increased that to 20% in uh, nine years. And then in 2010, they increased that to 30% by, uh, by 2020. Um, and this is a state where oil and gas is the largest employer uh, in the state with 6% of the uh, labor force and they represent 7% of the economy. But Colorado voters uh, uh, said this is important enough, we need to be uh, renewable, we want to make that transition from uh, where we are currently. Um, I was talking to the, the president of Public Service of Colorado just uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, they, they just finished building a, a coal-fired power plant in uh, Colorado. Uh, got them a lot of, uh, let's just say the city of Boulder no, long, no longer wants to buy electricity from XL Energy. I mean, that's how passionate some people are about uh, clean energy and uh, what we need to do. Um, you know, the issues that uh, every state faces with regard to their re renewable portfolio standard is, where's the money going to come from? Who pays for the transmission lines? And, and, and quite frankly, are electric utility incentives aligned with clean energy? And I, I won't touch that, but... Um, so you look at this, uh, this chart, darker is better from the standpoint of the wind power that's available. And you can make some generalizations by looking at the uh, United States. Uh, one is that most of the wind is west of the Mississippi, okay? Uh, and you look at the states where it seems to be very prevalent. Um, you know, the, the dark uh, blue and oh, I get this. The dark blue in uh, Colorado, those are the mountains. And you're not gonna put wind turbines up on the top of a, uh, of a mountain in Colorado, just impractical and, and uh, so, this is relatively meaningless in terms of being able to exploit that. Uh, most of the wind is west of the Mississippi. Uh, most of the wind looks to be in states where there aren't a whole lot of people. Um, and so, you know, that's problematic from the standpoint of, well, how do you get the wind from where the people are, where the wind is to where the people are, and that's where you get into these, uh, these grid issues. How do you get wind from North Dakota down to Chicago? Just isn't going to happen. Texas is our biggest state for wind. They have over a quarter of the uh, wind energy in the U.S. Uh, Iowa is number two, um, followed by California. Uh, Iowa has been very aggressive about attracting wind. And then in the uh, Columbia River Gorge up here, uh, between Washington and Oregon, they have about 4,000 megawatts of wind up there, so very active. But the East Coast, you, know, you ain't going to put any wind down in Florida or Georgia. It just isn't there. On the East Coast, uh, New York's got some wind um, that hasn't been performing as well as they thought, but they're, they're, they've got some wind up there, uh, and we'll look at offshore in a minute. And it's some mountain peaks in West Virginia and North Carolina. But essentially, the wind is in the west, a little bit in the east, um, and uh, a lot of the good wind resources are already uh, being used. Big farms, big turbines is typical for the U.S. 
issues that you run into is that the wind doesn't always blow when you want it. You look at uh, summer peak, you want most of your generation in June, July, August. Well, here, it's just an example of Iowa. It doesn't blow as hard when you want it the most. If it blow hard in the winter, okay, you have a winter peak, so that's good. But uh, when you want it the most, it, it isn't as strong. That's an issue for uh, wind. Wind has about a 30 to 40% capacity factor. That means that wind turbines uh, will only work about 30 to 40% of the time because the wind's only blowing strong enough 30 to 40% of the time. The other thing, uh, I talked about daily peak. Uh, this chart shows two things. Uh, says, you know, the higher you are, the better the wind is. Uh, but here in Texas, you know, you'd like to, to have your maximum wind, you know, in the, in the afternoon when everybody's coming home and flipping on the air conditioner. Well, unfortunately, the wind isn't necessarily blowing strongest when you need it the most. So these are some issues that, that wind energy faces in terms of being a viable uh, long-term alternative for us in, in uh, as far as renewable energy. Uh, the other thing, too, is that the wind isn't the same from year in to year out, okay? Uh, you look at this, this is uh, some data from, from Minnesota. If uh, you did your pro forma thinking uh, your, your power plant was gonna have that much wind uh, and uh, you get into the next year and it's doing this, you're not gonna, your investors aren't gonna be very happy because you just don't have the wind resource that you had based your pro forma on. So in terms of how much testing do you do, is it a year in advance before you put up a wind turbine? Those are some of the risks that you run into because year in, year out, the wind doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily the same. Um, other things that uh, are associated with wind turbines, you got uh, shadow flicker as they go around and does that cause craziness in cows? Um, there are uh, avian issues, there have been some, uh, you know, a lot of early studies out in California. Now that wind turbines are rotating slower, bigger, seem to be less of an issue, but there are uh, issues with bats and birds uh, and their mortality with wind turbines. Uh, radar, uh, you wouldn't think, but uh, having, you know, steel tubes 250 or so feet in the air has an effect on radar, whether it's military or whether it's uh, commercial uh, around airports, it, it disturbs that. Uh, I said earlier, uh, they are prone to lightning strikes, which can be problematic, um, and they will accumulate in northern climates. You'll get ice on the blades that uh, will have a tendency to shed, and and it may fall off, and, and uh, if you've got surrounding structures, it could be an issue with some, uh, some ice falling on you, okay? Some of the players. In 99, uh, the largest uh, worldwide wind manufacturers were NEG Micon, Danish company. They're not up there anymore. Uh, Vestas is number, was number two in 99. They're still up there, a Danish company. Uh, Gamesa is still in business. They're a Spanish company. They were a joint venture with uh, Vestas. They were number three. They're still in business. A German company called Enercon was number four. Enron was number five, and hopefully all of you know that Enron's no longer around. Uh, number six was Bonus, uh, which is also a Danish company. Uh, Vestas, oops, Vestas bought NEG Micon to increase their market share. Siemens bought Bonus to increase their market share and get into the wind business. GE Energy bought Enron's wind business back in 2000, 2001. Uh, and uh, Clipper, uh, here one of the um, U.S. manufacturers, uh, was just acquired uh, by United Technologies, okay? Uh, relative to how wind energy is doing from an uh, investment standpoint, I'll just show you a couple of um, uh, statistics here. In the U.S., uh, GE has the largest installed base with over four gigawatts. They're twice as big as number two. That's Vestas, uh, a Danish company. And then number three is Siemens. If uh, you invested in a pure wind play in, uh, say, you know, five years ago, say you bought some shares, $100 uh, shares in Vestas, uh, if you were smart enough to sell at the peak in, in August of 2008, you'd, uh, you'd have made over 500 bucks on your $100 investment. Today, uh, you'd have, it'd be worth 137 bucks, okay? So still above water. The same time period, S&P 500, you're about flat. So you're better than the S&P 500. Some of the other pure wind plays, uh, Clipper, uh, your $100 investment would be worth $18 now, so not too good. Uh, Gamesa, if you'd have sold in 2008, you'd have doubled your money. Uh, if you try to sell it now, you'd get 40 bucks for your $100, okay? You talk about uh, do government policies matter? One of the things that, uh, you know, this early buildup here was in California. One of the things that the uh, U.S. government did was they had this thing called the PTC, Production Tax Credit, and uh, they turned it on. Turn it off, 
Turn it on, turn it off. And you look and you see here, okay, when the PTC, which was two cents a kilowatt hour, 1999, you had a lot of installations. They turned it off at the end of, uh, of 1999 and virtually nothing in 2000. Turned it on back again in 2001, lots of installations. 2002, it, it lapsed again, nothing. 2003, on. So, you know, relative to uh, do government policies have an impact? You bet they do. You know, and if you're really uh, earnest about developing wind technology, you wouldn't do this. You know, if you're an investor and you're, you're relying on a government policy that is flipping on and flipping off and you don't know whether it's going to be there, are you really going to invest in that technology? And that's, that's some of the issues that wind has had in its early, uh, early development. But you see uh, 2000, you know, nice ramp up, uh, pretty much mirrored the natural gas price. As natural gas got more expensive, wind became a more attractive technology. Uh, as natural gas supplies increase, natural gas prices come down, uh, whether they're correlated, uh, causal, or just correlated. Uh, 2010 was a, was a relatively bad year uh, in terms of number of installations just because of, I think, overall economy um, and uncertainty about where wind was going to go. Okay, um, you know, some of the things that governments do, we talked about a production tax credit, feed-in tariffs, they can uh, uh, allow accelerated depreciation, interest-free debt, uh, grants, and states, as we, we saw earlier, renewable portfolio standards, you have to have this much by this time or else, or they can give tax incentives. And you look, uh, U.S. growth, most of this U.S. growth early on was in California. Governor Jerry Brown was, was pretty uh, active in promoting wind energy. Uh, now that he's governor again, we'll see whether he kicks California back into gear with getting more wind energy in the states, in that state. They kind of got there and, and stopped uh, for uh, much of their development. Okay? Let's uh, real quick on, on offshore. Uh, you look at uh, offshore in the U.S., uh, a little bit in the Gulf Coast. Uh, once you get south of Virginia, eh, probably not that worthwhile in terms of an energy resource. The darker the color, the redder the color, the better the wind. So you look up in the uh, uh, New England area, lots of good offshore wind. Lots of nice sunrises. So we'll talk about Cape Wind in a sec. Uh, in the west, um, you know, the, the, the uh, slope drops off too, quick, too, uh, too soon for the technology to allow you to really do um, wind off the west coast. Look at Cape Wind uh, real briefly. Uh, this is Cape Cod, um, and you've got uh, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, they want to put uh, 130 or so wind turbines uh, on 24 square miles. It's about five miles offshore, um, about 10 miles from uh, Nantucket. Uh, total capacity would be about a little less than 500 megawatts. The turbines are going to be 250 feet tall. When the blade comes down close to you at the water, still be about 75 feet above water. Uh, they say they've done some modeling from Cape Cod beaches. It'll protrude, uh, protrude about half an inch above the horizon. But uh, if you look at where this is, um, you know, Cape Cod gets most of their energy today from natural gas and bunker oil fired power plant. Uh, Cape Wind would be able to produce about 75% of the energy needs for Cape Cod, Nantucket, and Martha's Vineyard. So here's a case of a wind turbine project being able to replace fossil fuel uh, fired power plant. Uh, it's uh, three miles offshore, so it's federal jurisdiction. Uh, however, because they need to widen highways and need to get cable access, there are 17 state and local and, and federal agencies they need to get permits from. They started in 2001 uh, with their permit application. Everybody in Massachusetts wanted the project, except for a couple of people. Uh, the I guess you can see the project from Hyannisport, and uh, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Uh, you know, came out and said, love wind energy, this just doesn't seem to be the right project at this time. Not the right project. Uh, Senator Kerry uh, didn't want it. Walter Cronkite apparently came out against it initially and then uh, changed his mind. Uh, fishermen, fishermen hate it because it's going to ruin their fishing grounds. But still, you know, about 60% of Cape Cod residents want it. They applied for a permit in 2001. Took the Army Corps of Engineers probably uh, about three, four years to draft uh, an environmental statement. They just really weren't ready for offshore wind, didn't know what to do with it. In 2005, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers got to shift that responsibility to MMS, the Minerals Management Service. And some of you remember the Gulf oil spill. MMS is the offshore agency that monitors oil and gas. 
So it went to MMS in the 2005 uh, energy bill. 2008, they issued their draft inf environmental statement. Final took a year later, so we're at 2009, and things start to get uh, interesting in 2009. Basically, between uh, 2001, 2009, uh, lots of hearings, lots of state and local issues, decisions, petitions, lawsuits, studies. Uh, the long and short of it is that at 2009, some local entities had, had refused, or still refusing to re issue the required permits. So the Massachusetts Energy Facilities Siting Board issued a super permit for Cape Wind that overrode all local permit requirements. Uh, Ken Salazar, the Interior Secretary, said in January of 2010, look, you guys need to get together. Um, at that point, the National uh, Park Service was entertaining a petition to make Nantucket Sound a, uh, na uh, put it on the uh, a National Register of Historic Places. So some tactics that people who don't want it were employing to try and get it to, de to uh, delay. So uh, Salazar said, I'll give you till March 1st to figure it out. Uh, uh, in April of 2010, he announced, I'm approving Cape Wind. In August of that year, uh, the uh, Massachusetts um, Supreme Court said, four to two, the state can override the community opposition and grant uh, Cape Wind the local permits it needed. So interesting state versus local. And then in October of last year, the uh, secretary announced that a 28-year lease had been signed. Uh, in November, they signed a power purchase agreement, meaning we'll buy your power uh, for about half of the wind turbines, or the, the, the output, uh, at about 18, a little over 18 cents a kilowatt hour, which is going to add about two bucks to everybody's uh, monthly bill. Uh, lawsuits were filed in June of 2010 by opponents. Um, violating it for violation of the Endangered Species Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the National Environmental Policy Act. When the power purchase agreement was signed in November, more lawsuits were filed uh, against the uh, power purchase agreement as violating numerous statutes. So where do things stand now? Well, uh, on East Coast, you know, offshore wind has a lot of hurdles, as you can see. Uh, federal government wasn't prepared and is still really playing catch up for this. Uh, MMS, FERC, who's going to regulate it, those kinds of things. You know, U.S. policies for offshore oil and gas are well established, but they're still in their infancy for uh, uh, offshore wind or offshore power. State over local authority. And, you know, an indication or an, uh, examples of what kind of tools people who don't want these projects can employ to block them. Okay? Um, in the interest of time, let me skip over Wyoming for a sec. And... Uh, Sorry, Wyoming. Let's go to Canada uh, real quickly uh, and look at Ontario. Um, you look at uh, uh, Canada's consumption, most of it's coming from dams and hydro. Uh, they're, they're very blessed with uh, having a lot of that resource. Um, you look at, uh, anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? You know, where's New York? Where's Ontario? This is a picture of the blackout from 2003 where uh, some high, high tension lines in, in Ohio touched some trees, sparked a, uh, a spread of outages as grids shut down, power plants shut down, and eventually, what, 10 million people in Ontario, 45 million people in the U.S. were without power for at least a day. Um, and all this triggered by a tree coming in contact with a high voltage line and a cascading effect. Well, Ontario said, we don't like to be, you know, that dependent on, we want to be more independent. They did a study in um, 2005 where they said that they're spending over $3 billion annually on health care costs due to coal-fired power plants, and they decided to do something about it. So what they did was they passed a Green Energy and Economy Act where they said we're going to attract green energy companies to Ontario. Uh, by requiring certain domestic content or provincial content. They've imposed uh, feed-in tariffs or, for, to attract uh, renewable energy to the, to the province. We'll pay you 80 cents a kilowatt hour if, for solar. We'll pay you an above market rate for wind to attract companies in. And then they developed a long-term energy plan where they said, we want to get rid of coal-fired plants by 2014. Uh, and you look at uh, coal is uh, this blue line here. What's interesting is they've got a lot of nuclear, and they're going to retain their nuclear as their basis. Uh, wind and solar, uh, they want to have that as 15% you know, or so of their generation by 2030. 
and they're figuring that conservation will uh, uh, give them another 15%. Okay? So they've laid that out. They expect uh, that this is going to cost about $87 billion, with about half of it being spent on nuclear and then the rest spread around those other uh, elements of their long-term plan. They look at, well, how are they doing? Coal's down 70%. Sulfur dioxide, that acid rain stuff, is down, what, 80%? Carbon dioxide, greenhouse, greenhouse ga gas, down 70%. They're pretty good, right? I mean, they're, they're achieving their plan. Well, what are the prospects? You know, a lot of solar and wind companies are coming to Ontario, so that aspect of it, bringing jobs to Ontario, that's good. Uh, however, uh, Japan, the U.S., EU have filed suit um, on the World Trade Organization that uh, their domestic content is violating their, uh, their international trade uh, treaties. And um, the current provincial government, which instituted this plan, uh, is widely expected to be voted out of office uh, fall of this year. And the new conservative government that's coming in has said that they are going to reverse a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these actions from the energy plan. So relative to the challenges that we have putting a national energy plan together, uh, Ontario has been out there. Uh, they've had a few years of it. They've made some great strides. And it looks like it's going to get uh, way later cut off. Questions? I've run a little long. Yes, sir. How do they violate international treaties? You know, of it, but in terms of uh, requiring a certain amount of domestic content, uh, that these jobs can only come from here. There are bilateral agreements with, say, Japan, et cetera, uh, for open access to markets. And that would be how that would be a, a violation, or the claim, anyway. Yes, sir. Well, you got to do a couple of years, uh, a year at least of study, how good's the wind, um, and then you got financing. So from the time you convince the farmer to let you have the land, lease the land, uh, until you get a wind turbine up, you're probably looking at two, maybe three years, minimum. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. you know, and, and trying to drag uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the seabed for a fish or whatever, uh, try winding your way around wind turbines. You know, you're going to get them snagged. It's going to be an obstruction. I don't know if the fish would go away, uh, but it'd just be hard for the fishermen now to, to navigate around them, I think would be the big thing. Yes, sir. You know, that's something that uh, we will export coal to, you know, countries like Germany and other things like that. Um, so, yeah, that, that is one of our exports as well. You know, natural gas for us, we consume all that we uh, have, so exporting natural gas would not be an option for us. Yes, sir. What do you hope will happen in the next 10 years that will make your grandchildren's lives better? Let me uh, touch on that when I wrap up. Other comments, question? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the cost of a single yeah, It's about a million uh, per megawatt to put one in the ground, roughly. So modern wind turbines these days are 2.3, 2.5, 3 megawatts. So you know, a million per megawatt is, is a good rule of thumb. OK, well, let me, let me wrap up here. Sorry about running long. Uh, you know, I want to talk to you about why sustainability and renewable energy are, are important for our future. Um, and really three things. I mean, number one, uh, whether we like it or not, the world is looking to the U.S. to lead in, the, in, this, in this capacity. You know, if we don't lead in, in energy policy, you know, there are other countries out there that are more advanced than us in terms of their energy policy. But, you know, are, is the world going to follow Spain? Is the world going to follow Germany? You know, the world is really looking for us to do something about it. Uh, and, and the things that we can do is, for example, just look at what we're spending, where our tax dollars are going, uh, and try and influence that. What can you do? Try and influence where your tax dollars are going. Uh, GAO did a study that from in 2002 to 2007, the amount of federal incentives for um, electricity, uh, almost 14 billion went to fossil fuels. 
less than three billion went to renewables. So that's something that we need to do to change that. Now, let's just say the scientists are wrong uh, and global warming isn't happening, uh, that we aren't changing, uh, you know, the sustainability of, of life on the earth by our actions. Let's just say that's true. From an energy uh, security or energy independence uh, perspective, uh, we need to wean ourselves off of foreign oil. And foreign oil fuels our cars. We need to get to electric cars. Electric cars are going to mean more electricity. Well, more electricity means more power plants, and, and why not, from a sustainability renewable uh, energy standpoint, make that new electricity demand more environmentally friendly, more high technology, uh, those kinds of things on a resource that isn't going to go away. We've got 80 years of natural gas left. Why build a natural gas power plant? So even from a, if, the, if global warming is not happening, it's just a natural uh, earth cycle, uh, from an energy independence, energy security uh, standpoint, we need to do something to um, you know, improve our electricity and from renewable resources. But if you look at it, what if the scientists are right? And the earth is getting warmer, and it's because of us. And the rate of change is unsustainable, and we need to do something to reduce our greenhouse gases, re reduce the amount that we're putting into the atmosphere that the earth can't absorb anymore. Well, if you look at it from that perspective, you know, can we afford to wait another 10 years before we do something about it? Or are we just going to reconfirm what we probably already feel, even though the science may be you know, in the margin or not, not overwhelmingly compelling to probably about half of the country? You know, at less than 5% of the overall electricity mix, you know, the future of renewables in the U.S. is not certain. Don't, don't think just because we've got 2% that the renewable is here to stay. We need to continue driving it. A one megawatt turbine will offset 1,800 tons of CO2 a year, okay? You want a future like this, where China, uh, Asia, uh, are producing twice as much CO2 into the atmosphere as we are currently? That's twice as much as we currently have. Can we sustain that? You know, it's going to be easy to let that happen. You know, is the convenient thing to do the right thing to do now? I don't think so. You know, these are problems that are going to take 20 plus years to solve. And all of us and all of you, uh, you know, you need to make sustainability part of your future if you're going to have a future worth living. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks, Brian, for inviting me. Uh, good luck, everybody, and uh, go Irish.